grab a cup of coffee, find a seat. There's several up front still. That means be quiet. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, we're towards the end of the summer. Seems like a lot of people are back in uh, full gear for the, uh, the next school year, which is awesome. So good to see a big crowd here. Um, as a reminder, uh, the restrooms that you guys came in were exactly to your right. So if you need to go, go past the doors and it's back in the um, far right corner when you first walked in. And this is a working office, and um, once we are finished here, um, this is just a reminder, we'll remind you again at the end of it, we're going to actually exit out these doors right here. And then next week, we're actually going to be entering in those doors over here. So the only time you should ever walk out that door is if you have to go to the restroom. So that just as a reminder, um, I guess I don't like people talking when they're working. Yes, Alex. Uh, yeah, you, you need to go. You can go. <laughs> You just stand by the door and I'll nod at you. <laughs> well, um, uh, I was asked the question, who here is a first-timer this week? We still got quite a few people. I love it. This is awesome. Um, good to see new faces. And, um, yeah, can, am I missing anything with an announcement? Yet? <laughs> and, it, it, actually, if you are an organizer, raise your hand. If you're an organizer, you're one of the founding members of <laughs> if you're a founding member of One Million Cups, raise your hand again. Th give these guys a round of applause. This is awesome. <laughs> and at, um, if you guys do want to help out, we had a few people that were um, kind enough to stay kid here a little bit earlier to help us set up this morning, which is awesome. I walked in and all the chairs were set up. It was a good feeling not to work when I got here. So um, if you do want to help out, please hang out afterwards, and we'll make another reminder um, towards the end of the presentations. We're always looking for new community organizers. But without further ado, I'm going to open it up, and it's going to be uh, Dan is going to share with us a little bit more about um, his winery that he has. Well, good morning. My name is Dan Stockhammer. Uh, I live out in West Edge County. We have a small Prairie Hill Vineyard and Stockhammer Farm is the farm that I grew up on. It's the home place for, every, if you ever meet a Stockhammer, they all started there. My great-grandfather came over in the 1880s. Uh, I, I want to congratulate the guys here and the ladies that are doing Million Cups of Coffee. I started in the Center for Entrepreneurship back in the 80s. I remember very, in Wichita State, and Jack DeBoer was very instrumental in getting that going. And he actually asked me and a few of the others uh, back in those days, we got to ride on his private jet all the way to Burbank to hear an entrepreneurial conference out there, and I got to meet Steve Jobs, and it was such a cool thing. Well, then I, becoming an entrepreneur is something that you get infected with, and it never stops. And so when I came back, I moved out to Sonoma County in 1987. That's a long story I don't have time for here yet, but... In 1998, uh, I moved back, and so Sonoma County is such a beautiful place. My wife was literally saying, you're taking me to Kansas? <laughs> and I said, I will plant grapes in Kansas. And so we started a vineyard in 2002. I grew up on the farm that I grew up on. I tell people when I was 17, I couldn't wait to get off the farm. I got to be 47, I couldn't wait to get back on the farm. And so simply, Stockhammer Farm is out. If you know where St. Mark's is, a mile and a half west, a mile north, we have what we think is one of the most beautiful venues in the state of Kansas. History of grapes in Kansas, if you go to Wikipedia, it truly is amazing. Uh, 1881 uh, grapes in Kansas and Missouri were one of the biggest grape growing uh, regions in the country. Wine was going, a uh, lot of wine being produced here in the Healthy plants love Kansas. It's got a lot of sunshine. It's not as nice as Sonoma and Napa simply because of the cool climate that comes in off the ocean at night. But we certainly can grow grapes here. Interestingly, uh, Cary Nation was also from Kansas. So by 19, 1881, actually, prohibition uh, started in Kansas. So that people didn't let that stop them. But when national prohibition hit, uh, it truly drew, uh, dried up the grape industry in Kansas and Missouri. California, they managed to keep it going to supply uh, wines for uh, masses and, and uh, religious purposes. But other than that, it 
that just dried up in camps. It wasn't until 1985 the Farm Winery Act was passed that we actually can see grape production in the state. So we grow four or five different varietals. If you ever want to get bored, you start asking me about grape viticulture, and I'll get into plant pathology, and I will bore you to death. But anyway, one of the things that what we have is a beautiful venue. I really think it's one of the most beautiful venues in all of Sedgwick County. And we have uh, 20 acres, and we're in the process. I tell people, this is me, of course, in 19 <laughs> or 2016, trying with a $600 farm all to get things going versus my friend Grady in front of a half a million dollar combine. If you're going to make a living in agriculture in Kansas, you either go big or you go very small and you make it very productive. And so the question is, can we on 20 acres make it? And I have been so fortunate over the last 15 years. People have helped me put together some beautiful buildings. The place is just getting gorgeous. And so, whoops, I, didn't, I don't want to go that. That's the last one. But we'll talk about that in a minute. I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing. And I thought this was the page that was coming up. But I'm just going to read to you some of the things we're going to be doing. Of course, we're doing weddings already. And what's happening right now, the county has uh, given us the indication that they're going to allow for agritourism on rural residential. <coughs> That's a big deal because otherwise you've got to through, jump through all kinds of hoops with uh, the county in order to allow for the type of uh, applications that we're going to have on that 20 acres, which is going to be weddings, conferences, farm-to-table dinners, bed and breakfast, because we have two, one really cute cabin right now by the vineyard that we're going to turn into a public where people can come out and have romantic liaisons and that sort of thing. <laughs> showers and rehearsals. A uh, beautiful place for showers and rehearsals, wedding rehearsals. It's drop-dead gorgeous. We have a two-story building. I don't know if you saw it there upstairs. It was a, one time a ballet studio. We've turned that to where the brides can have the whole place to themselves. And then uh, that's the building right there. And we're, building, we're planning on building a whole event venue. Uh, we're doing retreats, wine and food pairings, classes. We may be actually doing classes. Reunions, of course. We've had some reunions out there. And I can't wait to do some concerts. Beer festivals, ag retail stores, we're going to focus as we move on into doing, we're planning on building a greenhouse and doing local produce, which is a whole nother level of effort when you start doing agri uh, organic production and that sort of thing. We do have horse pastures. I, I rent the south pasture out to uh, three horses, and we have three horses of our own. We hope that, you know, like when we do this fall, we're going to do a pumpkin patch. We're going to have uh, hay rides. And we want it, we, I took the whole arena and I planted pumpkins all the way around it. So we've got pumpkins growing all over the place out there in the midst of straw bales. And so it's really meant for a place where you can bring grandkids and kids and just have a great time. What we really want to do is to bring a little bit of that beautiful Sonoma County, Napa County environment here to Sedgwick County. And hopefully it will spread because I, I love the people in here in Wichita. And we'd like to do something so you don't have to go all the way to Sonoma County in order to get a little bit of wine country. And we can do it here in Kansas. It just takes the time to grow the grapes. It takes about three years to get them up and running. And so as a result of all of what we've done out there, I've got all of these people coming around me now. I have Joa Schwinn, who's from Sonoma County. And am I about out of time? I am out of time. Shut up. <laughs> You're doing so good. I missed You're my cue. So <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're okay. Hey, we're going to let you keep going. Um, we're going to do a question and answer. So if you have a question, please raise your hand high. And let me see, maybe before the last question has been asked, because that would be great. So we're not standing around looking. Yes, sir. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, I, he's the run running. See, sure. I've got this mic right here. Yes, so I have sir. all powerful. Uh, Jake's also got the mic, so look for him in the red shirt. And uh, he's, he's a really good looking kid. Let's keep the romantic questions down to a, maybe a minimum. And uh, we have, go for it. Well, that was last week with Susanna. But <laughs> Um, kind of a technical question, but what kind of varietals of grape do you grow? And then also with the difference, like as you kind of mentioned earlier, um, different from the, the moist, humid air that you get in Sonoma County to Kansas, how does, how does that affect the grape? Actually, I think the air here is more moist and humid. The dew point, in my opinion, is one of the 
negative factors. When it gets so hot and humid here, the thing, thing in Sonoma County, it can get up to 95 or 100 in the summer, but in the evening, because the fog comes in, it brings it down to like 60, 65. My friend Greg here lives in, has lived in Sonoma County. He's living with me now uh, out here helping. And so Kansas, I think it's the intensity of the in moisture, and it doesn't have that 25-degree swing. Uh, but still, it, it just doesn't make, although it, if you read Wikipedia, Kansas, uh, local Kansas wines have won many awards nationally. We, we make good wine. If you've ever been up to Grace Hill, it's awesome. D meet Dave and Natalie Solo, Jeff, of course, Brian. Best winery in the state. That's where I sell my grapes, too, is Grace Hill Winery. And they do awesome job, all the way from sweet whites, dry whites, sweet reds, to dry reds. It's not far. I mean, from Mays and 21st, which is my side of town, we're seven miles west and two miles north. 30, corner of 215 West and 37th. What we're hoping to do, the venue, of course, is the big thing. Uh, if a girl comes out and they're, they're friends, they love the place, we'll make more money on the wedding venues and meetings than we do on grapes. Although I am making money on grapes every year if the birds don't take it. And so the, uh, the, the at some point, I'm going to keep planting. I have a little over an acre now. 550 plants is an acre. It's a lot of work to prune it in the fall and in the spring, or rather between February and March and then, but I love doing it. What we're trying to do is get some help there now to help me do that, and which I have had to come around. And so uh, if I, you can get maybe five tons of grapes max on an acre. I can sell grapes for probably 75 cents a pound to Dave. And so you figure it out, five tons, 10,000 pounds of grapes at 75 cents. We can come up, that's a lot better per acre than wheat at $5 a bushel, 50 bushel an acre. You got to have, what, 100 acres to clear 25 before expenses. That's why you're dealing with 1,000 acres before you can make 250,000, and that's before expenses. Now, I don't want to deal with 250, or with 1,000 acres. I'm going to focus on, a ha on 20, and with between all those different things, I rent the horse pasture out. I am making money on the grapes. We're going to be doing venues. All when we get into branding, my wife did a PHV logo, which by the way, our brochure is out there. I think I left it. Oh, there it is, Greg, if you could hand me the brochure. There's one out here. We have a beautiful logo, PHV. My wife did this, and my wife just passed away 10 days ago. So I'm going to leave this as her legacy, and I'm going to focus on this for the rest of my life out there. I have no desire to retire. It's the last thing I want to do. I'm going to retire on the vineyard and have all my friends, hopefully you, come out and visit us in the future. Yeah. What kind of relationships or partnerships are you looking for with local businesses? Well, when we get into the organic produce, we'll be providing, and we do plan on doing this, produce to local restaurants, and then they can say produce to PHV. Uh, other things that we're going to do, we've had American Ag Credit come out for a corporate event there. We had a wonderful time. They spent two days in the, in the cabin doing their national meeting. We've had uh, lots of interest in family reunions. We've had, uh, it's the perfect place for a wedding shower. The building that we have there right now holds 35 to 75 max. But if we're the, what we're planning on building is going to be world class, and it's going to hold up to 300 people. In the back. What is your source of water out there? Okay, 80 foot down is the best well water in the state of Kansas. And I've literally thought of putting a PHV logo on a bottle of water and make it, because in my opinion, it's the best water I've ever tasted. But it's artesian water. It's from about 80 feet down. I have three wells on the property now. I'm planning on having several more because I want to keep pumping water in my big pond. I have three ponds, and the big one dries up when it gets dry. So I want to pump water into it to keep it from going dry when it gets really dry. Yeah, so, so just clarify, so are you both selling grapes and making wine? Is I've made wine with friends, but when it comes to, w we're not making wine legally. You can do up to <laughs> 250 gallons in the state of Kansas without getting a permit. And so we've made up to 250 gallons, and I've given it to clients and friends and thrown some of it away because it wasn't that good. You know, we're learning how to make wine. What we do now is we sell our grapes. We are a vineyard, not a winery, technically. And so a vineyard, under state law now, if I give my grapes to Dave over at Race Hill and he makes wine out of it, I can take some of that fruit back 
and sell it on my property, although we're not doing that yet. We hope to do that in, in the next year or two, three. You mean, we, you mean the wine? Yes, we'll actually sell the wine on the property, but right now, all you can do when you come to my place is I'll give you a bottle of wine just for showing up if you want to come okay, but if you do, Okay, but if you do the wine, so it takes you three years to do the grapes, then how many years does it take to do the wine? Another three or four? No, if, if you can crush. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick summary. We yeah. used to do this in Sonoma County. We had a group we formed called the Royal Vino Viticultural Society of Pachyderms. <laughs> what it was was a bunch of Republicans that liked to drink a lot of wine. Right. <laughs> so what we did is we, 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 we harvest gonna, the fruit. By the way, you're going to need it in the next, yeah. next couple of months. <laughs> we lived right in front of Chateau Souverain in Alexander Valley, the most beautiful place I've ever been. And we would go in to get second harvest. The Mexican laborers would come through there to run through because they get paid by the volume that they produce. So there's all kinds of fruit left. It's called second harvest. We'd go in and we'd pick the second fruit. We'd put it in. We'd, that's what we do here. You take it and you get it crushed through a destemmer, put it in big, or big barrels, and you put the yeast in it. It ferments. It takes about a week. Then you press it out, and then you pour it into carboys, and then that settles it out. You do that through three times. You rack it off the leaves is what it's called. Then you clarify the wine. Then basically you can let it sit for a year. You can drink it right away. And, and it, I've never had been good on developing a wine cellar because I tend to drink it right away. <laughs> so how far do your grapes go? How d far do they go? Yeah, so who, who's some of your clients in, in another country? Oh, I've, uh, th our fruit has been enjoyed by people all the way from the California wine industry to uh, New York. You know, we give our wine to people. When you, if state law, once you become a winery, now you can comply with the state. Taxes, all kinds of regs and rules of production. I don't even want to mess with it. I, right now, I'm focusing on a lot of roses, trees, the most beautiful, you won't believe, in five years, this place is going to be like Botanica almost. It's beautiful. And it's a lot of work. And, and really, so what I've been focusing in is the development of the property as well as the vines. Now, the vines are not going to make me a million dollars. But if I get develop a good brand and we have a million people come out there, maybe we'll make a million dollars. That's the idea. We're going to develop multiple revenue sources from what I said. And, you know, I have a uh, friend that has a friend up in Asteria that has a pumpkin patch outside of Salina. Last year they had 13,000 people come to that pumpkin patch. That's a lot of people. So he's saying he's making more money doing pumpkin patch than he is as an engineer. So that's why I'm doing a pumpkin patch this fall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want 13. Thousand though, I mean, a thousand for the first year would be fine, and then if it goes well, we'll keep increasing so that everybody in town knows. If you want to do a pumpkin patch in the fall, take your kids out to Prairie Hill Vineyard. Any other questions? Do you have any questions? Well, the last question that we like to ask is, what does the community can we do to help you? Referrals, of course. If you know somebody getting married or somebody that wants to do a reunion or any of the things I've just said, we'd love to have them come out. We have a beautiful website, which is prairiehillvineyard.com. Uh, and we're going to be uh, hopefully one of the first that gets into the agritourism zoning designation that the county is going to allow. And then we need to promote that uh, Sedgwick County really has a lovely rural uh, ambiance that we can enjoy, that you don't have to leave the state in order to do something like that. And so my number, if you ever want to call me and come on out and visit, we'd love to host you. God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I think your uh, offer of three bottles of wine is a great one. <laughs> if anybody wants to meet out there for lunch, that would be great. Uh, this is a presenter's cup. It's a one of a kind. I think you're the only one that's ever gotten one. So congratulations. Uh, put that. Put some wine in there. Don't sell it though. Yeah, I won't. Um, I'll drink it. Perfect. Early. 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 In the I, my, our saying is, we will drink no wine before 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thanks again for coming to One Million Cups, and uh, as always, a couple little announcements we have here. Um, Applaud Her is happening on August 12th. That's, uh, what day is it? That's Friday. Uh, it's uh, an opportunity for um, Women Who Code, Wichita, is putting this together to celebrate what women have done for the Wichita community. It'll be a great event, just kind of a, a thing to make sure that we're recognizing everyone. And then at the Wichita WSU Metroplex, I invented something, now what do I do? Is August 17th um, at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, great 
thing offered by, let me make sure I attribute this to the right organization. Uh, yeah, K uh, Kansas Small Business Development Center, putting that on. All of those events are right there at startupwichita.com, which works now on all subdomains. So you're welcome for that. You don't have to know what that means. It just works. Uh, and you can add your event, too. If you have one, make sure that you go to startupwichita.com and put your event there. I do want to call out uh, Get Started Wichita. August 12th is the last day that they're accepting applications for pitches. So make sure that you go to grab a flyer that has the website on it. You can put your... Uh, your uh, apply to pitch there. And if you don't want to pitch, that's fine. Just come to the event. It should be amazing. We're going to get to see five Wichita entrepreneurs present their their thing. And if uh, Andy Andy is over there, he's in the newspaper today, so make sure you look at that and figure out what he's there for. Um, last week, we had a uh, great idea. Who has someone that they think should present at One Million Cups? Like a suggestion. Who wants to make a suggestion of someone to present at One Million Cups? You can raise your hand now. Right. Well, I, no, I don't, I don't want Andy's suggestion. I mean, I do, I don't really either. but I want... He, I, I'm not going to let him use the mic. I, that, that's, it's good. I, like, Andy, I appreciate what you're doing. Yes, perfect. But I want to get other people. Like, you're so involved. There we go. Central Standard Brewing? I completely agree. Come on up, sir. Yeah, that's a good call. Central Streets would be good, too. Do what? It doesn't exist, but if it did... Bob, uh, thanks for the suggestion. We'll reach out to Central Standard Brewing, or Jake will. Or either Jake or Jake. Either Jake will. And uh, real quick, before you sit down, back down, what is this your – scoot over from the speaker for me. I'm going to try to embarrass you as much as possible. So um, is this your first time to win Million Cups? Um, four. Fourth time. Yeah. Uh, that's embarrassing for me because I should recognize you by now, right? I apologize. Uh, and then what brings you to One Million Cups? What makes you want to come back? I, I just enjoy getting out and hearing about different things from the community and, and uh, some of the businesses that we like to support locally. Great. Thanks for coming. You two can uh, get a presenter cup if you come up with an idea. I think that was good. We should keep doing that. Jake agrees. So I'm going to give the microphone back to Jake now. And if you know the guys at Central Standard Brewing, now tell them that they're being called out at One Million Cups to present at One Million Cups. So that's going to push them a little bit further to actually get them here to do that. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the folks from uh, Red Strategies Corporation. So let's uh, give Brandon a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so... During the Vietnam conflict, the Air Force was losing aircraft at an alarming rate, and the Air Force decided that, uh, that there might be something they could do about it. So as they looked at their data, they realized that if a pilot could get 10 combat missions underneath their belt, they became dramatically more survivable. So how were they going to take care of this? What was, what was the solution to this? Well, the answer was Red Flag. And Red Flag is a school at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. And the pilots that needed this training uh, would go out and they would fight the bad guy, the more, the more uh, experienced pilots, and they were called aggressors. And these bad guys would fight the, uh, the younger pilots. They would get their 10 combat missions in. And indeed, they were much more survivable when it came to uh, their conflict in Vietnam and, in fact, uh, after that. So good morning. My name is Brandon Rosario. I'm the founder and the president of Red Strategies Corporation. And although Red Strategies doesn't do any flying, in 2002, the Air Force stood up the information aggressors. And the aggressor thought process is the same. So what we're looking for is to be able to, to do battle in an information domain, so we're no longer talking about getting shot down, right? We're talking about doing battle in an information domain uh, in a threat-realistic environment, so that our clients are able to defend themselves against the adversary, the adversary being somebody who is after your information, uh, when the time comes. So the, uh, that's where Red Strategies cut their teeth, was in this aggressor scenario. And that is the direction that Red Strategies is headed, is making sure that we are giving our clients a realistic threat against an information opponent. Uh, this is an information security thought process, and as I say information security, I want to make sure that everybody understands that information security doesn't just reside in the network, on computer networks. Information is anything that 
keeps your business running, anything that's critical to your business. So it could be in your heads, uh, it might be in a desk drawer, it could be on an assembly line, or written down on a whiteboard in an office somewhere. So we're talking about information security. Red Strategies is a security consulting red team. And somebody once referred to us as a security secret shopper. And it's a pretty good analogy. So if you think of a secret shopper, somebody goes into a retail environment, they are live and covert. Nobody knows that what they're doing. They have their retail experience, and then they come away from it and report to higher headquarters. Headquarters is able to get a true understanding of what's happening in this retail environment because, of course, nobody knew, the employees didn't know what was going on. So we bring that same mentality to the security career field. We're a veteran-owned and operated company right here in the Wichita area. All of us with 13 or more years in the aggressor or in the red team world, uh, testing DOD facilities, that's Department of Defense facilities around the globe. We are intelligence and adversarial experts, always looking at our client through the eyes of the adversary and educating. We're educators. At the very end of all of this, we must educate our client so that they don't repeat the same mistakes that we were able to beat them with, so that they are more survivable when the adversary is attacking, I use attacking in quotes, is attacking their information, trying to take information from them. So why red strategies? What's the big deal, right? Well, corporate espionage took $500 billion away from the American economy last year. So that's a pretty good reason for red strategies, right? So I don't purport that red strategies is going to uh, take care of this $500 billion loss. I wish I could. But there is clearly something wrong. If the security experts are doing everything that they can and there's still $500 billion in loss, what's, what's the error? What's the mistake? Well. The guys that are protecting things, protecting our information, uh, they're, they're kind of doing it in a way that they've always done it. They've always cut the end of the, the ham hock off in order to fit it in the pot. Um, if anybody knows that analogy, go ahead and laugh. Um, they do self-inspections. Uh, they do exercises. But these things are inherently flawed to succeed. And so they succeed, and they continue down the same path. And then you get what you've always got. And could that be nothing, Aerosmith? Um, and so, so what we need to do is really blow up these security programs. And they don't want to do that. They're employees. I appreciate that. Um, it's not comfortable to go in and blow something up that you own. But that's where Red Strategies comes in. We're ready, willing, and able to blow up their programs. So what do we do? We conduct live, covert, physical penetration tests of our clients' information and their physical structures. We provide a realistic threat emulation without breaking anything or hurting anybody. It's important. I don't, don't ever want to hurt anybody. We find vulnerabilities before the adversary does, and then we provide cost-effective, risk-based countermeasures. And why are they cost-effective? Because almost always it is the human in the link that's broken, which means it's procedural. We're not talking about equipment. So procedures are pretty inexpensive to fix. It might take a little bit of time, but not a lot of money. We don't sell anything. So although we may have got in through a broken door, uh, a fence may be busted, we'll certainly point those things out, but we don't install those things, we don't sell them, so uh, we don't have that conflict of interest. Probably the most important thing about what it is that we do is we provide honest feedback to our clients. Uh, sometimes it's uh, your baby's ugly kind of honest feedback. And it's, it's necessary, and I'm telling you, it's necessary because it's worked in the military, when I can sit down with uh, somebody that outranks me by quite a little bit, and I can be brutally honest with them and professional, we have to handle this professionally, then uh, it is received much better. And the other half of that is education to the employees, because the employees are the ones that are taking care of your, the business owner's, stuff. And if they aren't trained on what the threat is uh, and what they can do to prevent the threat, uh, information being lost to the company, uh, then everything that we've done is for naught. All right, I'm going to stop you right there. Thank you. Um, <laughs> looks like you might have a little bit more to go. Everybody maybe look to your left and right. If you don't know that person, be aware. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and turn off your cell phones. They're being hacked right now. Um, looks like you have a little bit more presentation. If we could start a question maybe with, what's the Red Strategies market? 
So right now we're predominantly inside the Department of Defense, uh, and although things are fine there, uh, I really, I know that we are a viable company uh, in corporate America. So some of the places that we think that we see ourselves, although I'm interested in some other opinions, are the energy sector, healthcare, entertainment venues, I think would be a good place for us to go. Uh, and what was the other one that I had written down? Transportation. So TSA does some aircraft stuff, but they don't do all of aircraft, rail, uh, and on the coasts with some shipping is kind of where we see ourselves. Can you like walk through a, a scenario that includes both the physical and like give an example of a scenario that you might? Okay, use? that's a good question. I planted that with somebody, but it wasn't him. <laughs> <laughs> so Told you right to the left. Let's so get around. <laughs> so. Uh, this is the scenario. Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory is the movie, so uh, not taking credit for any of this stuff. Mr. Slugworth, for those of you who don't know and haven't seen the movie, you should. Shame on you. Mr. Slugworth is an agent of Willy Wonka, so let's start with that. He's an uh, employee of Red Strategies. Willy Wonka calls him up and says, hey, uh, we need your services. So he comes out, and they decide what it is that they want to do. Willy Wonka says, um, what keeps me up at night is this everlasting gobstopper. It's a big deal. I can't have anybody getting the recipe. I don't want them to see the assembly line. This is a big deal. He says, uh, Slugworth says, I got it. What else? He says, well, he says, while you're out there, if you could check out Wonka Vision and the fizzy lifting drink, uh, those are some other areas where I've got some worries, and I think that it's something that you ought to take a look at. Perfect. Uh, Red Strategies is always interested in staying safe and legal, so we make sure that we consult with their lawyers and our lawyers. Uh, what are some safety concerns for you? And Wonka says, I, I need you to stay away from the, the uh, chocolate river, right? Uh, Augustus got caught up in there last week, and we, we can't have anybody near there. Um, the Oompa Loompas aren't strong enough to pull people out, so let's stay away from that. We got it. We want to make sure that nobody gets hurt. Um, he says, Wonka says, you know, I only own the property inside the fence line and the, the borders, the uh, walls. And Slugworth says, great. Uh, I'll coordinate with local law enforcement so that if we find ourselves outside and, in fact, maybe get arrested or dealt with by the police, we've, dealt, we've talked to them in advance and we're taken care of. So we proceed. This is the maze that we're going to run and the things that we're looking for uh, on our mission. So Red Strategies heads back to the house and we start doing some open source intelligence or just research. Um, although I shouldn't say just research, this isn't a Craigslist search. Uh, this is some truly deep diving, about a week's worth of work, two or three people, um, some really nitty-gritty uh, deep dives into the company uh, and the people that run the company. We need to know uh, what they look like, what they wear, um, times that they go to work, what they produce, when they produce it, how they ship it, I'm just details and details and details so that when we go there, we can look and act and talk like them. We're certainly going to do a physical reconnaissance. We need to go take a look at the place, see what it looks like. Uh, can we fit in there? We're not going to be able to be Oompa Loompas in this case, so we're going to have to take a different vector. If it is a un like place and it has a front door that we can go in, that's certainly something that we'll do. We'll walk inside and take a look around. We want to make sure that we're filling our brains as much with this place as possible. Social engineering is a huge skill of ours. Uh, we need to make sure that we are acting like somebody else um, in order to get what we need. We create stories to make things work, to include bad paperwork. All right, so we've seen Wonka Vision. We got a little dirt on that. Fizzy lifting drink is going to be the next target on our list. As we move forward, we're definitely going to create fake IDs to get our stuff done. Um, and we may have found good templates on our client's website uh, because somebody's taken a picture of an ID and we start to recreate that maybe as we walk around and physically see it hanging from a rear view mirror, something like that. Uh, one of my good buddies says that uh, the best way to get inside of a locked door is you knock and you act like you belong. You've got something good for them that they don't want to turn down, social engineering. Once we're inside, we're going to squat. Or there's a lot of different things we can do, but squatting is certainly one of them. Underneath the table, in a broom closet. In the end, what we're doing is sticking around until you head home and we can have our run of the place. And we're going to go through desk drawers and look for more access. That's what we're looking for. We've got some targets that we're looking for. Uh, we may or may not work with cyber operators. If we do, what we might do is plan a wireless access point to get them inside the firewall so they can do their nasty deeds. We will certainly use, if radio frequency ID or prox cards are used at the place of business, we will, we've got a device that will capture that data from about two feet, 30 inches away maybe. 
we can take that data, take it back to the office, clone it, and now we've got a card that acts just like the card that you had in your pocket. All right, so if you've seen the movie, you know that uh, Slugworth was not able to actually get the candy, uh, although he was able to get to these other two places. So uh, we are not always able to get everything that the client asks for, and the reason is, in this case, Wonka had some good defenses up. So we're going to run the good things and the bad things. I talked about giving good, honest feedback, and uh, we also want to talk to all the people. This is uh, one of the presentations that we gave. I think Steve uh, set an amplifier on fire or something. Um, so this is imperative. We have got to let people know what the threats are. And I don't mean like uh, doomsday threats. I just mean uh, you know, normal, everyday threats and how you can protect yourself. Does that answer your question, sir? I'm glad I was prepared. I feel like you had that set up. Or <laughs> I feel socially engineered. Any questions? You said your customers are primarily Department of Defense right yes. now. Yep. Do you do? Do you have any other customers? Are you looking for any other customers? Are Absolutely. you looking to get into small business? So we certainly are willing to work with anyone. Absolutely looking for. Um, that's a lot of what this is about: is trying to get into the corporate side. Uh, small business. I guess it depends. I'm a realist. I understand that there's a lot of companies that what we do is uh, it's overkill. Um, but yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, I'll come down and sit down with anybody. Obviously, this is very similar to Red Cell in the military. What uh, safety precautions do you have as far as coordinating with local LE or armed security to make sure that uh, nothing bad happens? Coordination is that we go and we talk to them and we let them know who we are, what we're doing, uh, full disclosure, um, and we've got the company that we're working with, the organization that we're working with um, on board. So it's a two-pronged attack. And the second one is training. Uh, we are verbal judo experts, which means we do absolutely nothing. If you tell us to stop, we stop. That's why we, everything we do has got to be covert, because all it takes is a little old lady to say, stop, stay right there, don't move. Now, if we can talk our way out of it, fine, but we will take no physical action to anybody at any time. Does that answer your question? Okay. You're in the middle. Sounds pricey. Yeah, it might be a little pricey for some. Um, I suppose um, when we're talking about the kinds of losses that, say, healthcare, um, I don't know uh, what we lost. Um, you know what, Delta Airlines, um, how much business did they lose due to a power outage? Um, and if I had access to their power plant and could have cut a wire, blown it up, um, if computer guys could have hacked it, how much did that cost them? And our value to that uh, is really quite low. Yeah, um, so uh, a two-week a two-week mission, um, all out. Uh, we're looking at uh, in the realm of thirty-five k. How do you get people to think proactively? Because it's always after the fact when they when they respond. Training and education, um, and it's unfortunate. You've, you got to make them aware. This is the, this is what should happen. You should have an organization internally that you don't have to contract out that. If it was my company, I'd probably do it once a quarter, maybe even more than that, where they were tested covertly all the time. And so it was just a matter of they were always up. Because our up now is, I don't know what it is, it's 30%, it's 40%. So we need to get that up to about 80%. And the, the way you do that is you, keep, you put, keep poking and you keep poking. Hi, can you give us an example of something you didn't expect to find that surprised you? Um, yeah, criminal activity um, on uh, fellow military members with uh, material they shouldn't have uh, in their desk drawers um, that requires um, federal law enforcement to get involved. So that's kind of it's kind of sad to have a guy that wears the same uniform as you, uh, looking at stuff like that. So that would be my, my biggest, hardest hitting. So uh, do you have, have you done any commercial engagements? None. Okay, next <laughs> question. <laughs> 
are you looking to get into the commercial market and how are you doing it? Absolutely. Uh, we've got uh, Apples and Arrows that's working with us to uh, generate that, that marketing want out there. Um, and I'm doing everything that I know how to do, which uh, may not be a whole lot, I don't know, um, on the LinkedIn side. Um, I'm also involved with uh, a couple organizations in, here in town to try and get that going as well. As you're moving forward, are you looking at potentially creating a small to mid-sized market portion of your business that can be accessed by people who have a need for a certain amount of security, but not necessarily governmental level? Um, there's many businesses, particularly things like accountants and lawyers and doctors and dentists and, you know, yada, yada, that have um, not the most appropriate security practices. It's even at something as simple as their receptionist has a computer screen that somebody can read. I mean, it's, it's the easy stuff, but it's also the stuff that people aren't really aware of. So, so what we do is so... Uh, malleable. We could do anything. We sit down with somebody and discuss it. And just like you're talking about, we could do, we could do just some training classes. Um, and we could do some training classes throughout the year. Maybe it's contracted for a year and we conduct one class a month. Uh, maybe we do one small uh, aggressor type activity as, as a client. We set it up like we're coming in as a client. There's, just, there's, a, there's a thousand different things that we can do. Uh, to Lynn's question, I think a kind of my ideal scenario is going to this location against this many buildings with this many people, um, and that's where I come up with this number. But the fact is, is that it's, it's very, very adjustable. Get in the front. So for those of us who are in more of the professional services industry, mm -hmm. we might not have secret formulas or things in our desk that might be uh, risk assessments. What, what could you do in terms of analyzing our customers' information, the data that we're storing, to provide a risk analysis? Is that a threat? Is that, is that a vulnerability for those types of businesses? Is the information, your customers' information, so. Um, Personal identifier information, things that, like if we're keeping credit card data. That kind of thing. Okay, so clearly those are, those are risks. The, the biggest risk for you, as far as I'm concerned, is me doing damage to your business. So what do I, I have to act as the right adversary. Um, if I go on to a, um, an army base, um, I need to act like a, an appropriate foreign intelligence adversary. That's not the right thing for you. Um, criminal element probably isn't the right thing for you. Probably what I'm after for you is I need to study and understand who it is that's after your data, and that is a competitor. And so would a competitor like to steal your data or your client's information or do damage to you, um, make you untrustworthy so that your clients just leave you and you dry up and die. So there's, it's, it's, this is a perspective thing, is how, how are you vulnerable? Um, you're vulnerable in a couple different ways. Does that answer your question? Okay. How do you keep up with the security with every new device becoming a smart device? I mean, a refrigerator is gonna be um, cyber security. Nope. No cybersecurity here. I don't, so no I don't know whether you've heard me. We are, I, I mean this um, in the most intelligent way possible, but we're a dumb organization. Um, <laughs> cyber, cyber stuff will continue to move forward, but if I, if I can beat your physical security, your cyber security will fail. If I can get physical access to your server or to your refrigerator, I can make, I can make it fail. So, but that on the other side, actually, Entry, using cyber, to okay, to get in. Absolutely. So you're talking about radio frequency ID. Anything that sensors every single device that's smart. Got it. So uh, access control, those kinds of things. Um, we we use we circumvent them um, instead of instead of having a turnstile, which is a one-person entry, highly secure. We convince somebody on the inside to open up the uh, gate where they allow trucks to come through and we go through there. There, are, there is always a way to beat the system because we are defective carbon-based units and we are easily deceived. Hi, Randy Green, American Gaming Experts. Uh, we service casinos nationwide and one of the, the services that we provide is CAD tactical maps for SWAT teams, for emergency responses, stuff like that, for 
you know, occupied buildings, casinos, and such like that. And we keep getting questions about secret shopper, you know, stuff like that for casinos because security is the biggest thing that a casino has to worry about if anybody's seen Ocean's Eleven. <laughs> the, uh, have you guys ever thought about partnering with a company that services casinos to be able to do that? Because that's something that I'm not even interested in and don't know anything about. All right. Well, my marketing company heard what you said, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so they're on it. And uh, I'll give you my card afterwards, and my information's up here. The answer Please. to your question is no, I haven't. Um, but that's those are the kinds of things that uh, I need to I need to think about and hear. Biggest tip you can give us. <laughs> Don't circumvent your own policies. You have created security policies at your business or in your house, you have an alarm. Set the daggum alarm when you leave. I don't mean, there's a lot of things that are wrong with alarms, but if you've got it, set, set it. It doesn't need to call back to the, to the alarm company. It just needs to make a loud noise. Don't circumvent your own policies. They're there for a reason. Follow them. Educate yourself. Education is everything. If you know what the threat is, if you know that uh, home break-ins happen between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. when you're at work or at school, then you need to keep that in mind as you leave the house during the day. Make it look occupied. Um, those, are my, those are my two that I wrote down. Any other questions? What does the community can we do to help you? I'm in town. Um, we are local. Uh, understand, I get that a lot of you, uh, this is not a service that is uh, necessarily for you, but you know somebody that it might be right for. Um, and know that, that uh, I'm super available. I can meet for lunch and talk on the phone. Um, if you're looking for little tidbits, uh, I'm your guy. Uh, we've got a small team that we're working with right now, and they're looking for us. So uh, that's it. I appreciate your time. Um, and here we have a secure 1 million cups cup. Uh, bugs are hidden right. underneath there, Super. so always double check those. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very really much. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Uh, that is the end of One Million Cups for today. Thank you for coming. And I guess we have. What do you? Oh, go Be out that sure way. Be sure you go out that door. And I did bring the flyers in for Get Started Wichita. So if you want to grab one on your way out, and then also did grab the um, amazing pamphlets for for Hill. So if you guys want to check this out, please come do so. But um, do not go out that door. That door. Thank you. And we'll security. see you guys next week. We got security.